Hello and uh, welcome. I want to teach you a little about um, securing a modern Windows device uh, in the cloud today. My name is uh, Pierre Larsen. I'm from uh, Denmark. I'm a Microsoft MVP in uh, Enterprise Mobility. A lot of the stuff I will talk about today is uh, how to manage a device in, in the cloud and where it makes sense to do it in the cloud and where it makes sense to do it in, uh, in a hybrid uh, way. So I will start by uh, defining what man modern management with the uh, EMS is. And we start with uh, easy to deploy and manage. And when we talk about easy to deploy, we also talk about uh, autopilot. So I will walk you through how to uh, configure some of the autopilot uh, configuration. I will not show you how autopilot is, uh, is working. Uh, many people have done that uh, before. Then I will talk a little bit about uh, the intelligent security that's built into Windows 10 and uh, what we can do by leveraging it with we, when we have uh, MDM and what we can do with, uh, with EMS uh, considering um, security on a, on a Windows device. And then every time we do a project, we do it by getting the best user experience uh, to the end user. So I will talk a lot about how to get the best user experience when we do modern. Some of the stuff we can also do when we do, uh, do hybrid. And then I will talk a little bit about the application deployment. Uh, application deployment in a modern way has been a hassle for the last three years after we got uh, Windows 10. We could only support single MSI files and uh, stores, uh, apps from the stores. So now we got uh, a new application model in, uh, in Intune, and I will show you how, it, uh, how it's working. So Windows 10 is, bo is born for modern management. What does modern management actually mean? It means that we need to do things in another way than we did earlier. That, can, that means different things for different companies for different uh, sectors of work, uh, one thing for schools, some things for, uh, one thing for banks, uh, and each uh, company has their own way of defining what modern management is, uh, is for those. Today I will show you the, the cloud way. Uh, we did a project uh, almost three years ago uh, today where we deployed uh, Azure AD devices with uh, automatic enrollment in, in MDM. It was not fun three years ago, but with the development of Intune and Windows 10 over the last uh, three years, we have actually gone a place where we can do it with a good user experience and a good experience for the admins today. So that is what I will walk you through. So the easy to deploy and manage, that is autopilot. Autopilot has some uh, issues today, uh, mainly when we talk about hybrid uh, domain joint devices. Last year at Ignite, Microsoft said, now it's coming. Uh, this year at Ignite, they say, now it's coming. And hopefully it's coming this year. So many customers I talk to want to go autopilot, but they don't want to get rid of the on-premise AD. So today we can only do autopilot on Azure AD devices. But when we start talking about uh, autopilot, we also need to talk about device, device li lifecycle management. So if we can get rid of maintaining imaging and drivers, take a device, send it directly out to the users, unbox it and get it off without any um, need of IT touching the device. That is a dream scenario for many companies. We need to get a simple process for both the users and the IT. When the user is getting a new iPhone today, they just unbox it, it gets managed and secure in a way that 
the company acknowledge it to be. We can do that with the Windows device in autopilot as long as we do it in the cloud way. And then we can autopilot reset it back, redeploy it back to a business ready state where we actually trust the device. So how does this work? We start by buying some devices from a OEM vendor or a, or a reseller. We get all the devices uploaded into uh, our autopilot uh, services. We can deliver the, the, the devices directly to the, to, the end, to the end user. We actually have companies who have uh, headquarters in, uh, in Denmark or in, on, on Sweden, where they have branch cases, uh, for example, for example in, in Russia. So they actually buy the devices in Russia send it back to Denmark or Sweden, get it in imaging, and send it back to the end user. And if it breaks and they need to reinstall the device, it goes the same way. Those places we have done autopilot where it's actually getting installed where the user is. So we need to get it in a business-ready state. We need to get it in a secure state where we actually trust the device. That is where autopilot comes in. We can Azure AD join a device, but we cannot be sure it's in a business-ready state before the user is, uh, is using it. And then in the complete life cycle of the device, we can do management, we can do application management, policy management, uh, and so on. And if the device breaks or some software um, goes bad or the device is uh, just not working as the user expected, then we can autopilot read redeploy the device wherever they are, if they're home, if they're in the office, uh, in the on vacation, it doesn't matter as long as there's internet connection. And afterwards, we can retire the device just as normally as we do when we have on-premise environment. So to get these autopilot devices uh, inside, our, inside our tenant, we need to get things automated. Um, so we need to group them in some way. We have different kind of uh, way of grouping it. We can do dynamic group with uh, all autopilot devices. I will show you how that, uh, that is working. But we can also use dynamic grouping based on device tags, order ID when you're ordering the, the devices. And then we have the possibility to deploy uh, application settings and security baseline based on different kind of uh, types of devices. And we can also do it manually, but nobody wants to do manual job if they can't uh, if they can get rid of it. So the autopilot uh, enrollment status page is relatively new. It's came out late, uh, earlier this, uh, this year. I actually don't like the name, uh, Windows Autopilot Enrollment st uh, Status Page, and that's because it's working whether or not you're running Autopilot, as long as you have it enabled and configured, and you Azure AD join a device, it will kick in. It will kick in for the first user, for the second user, and so on. We have a way of overcoming that uh, now it's gone into in, in tune uh, a couple of weeks ago. So what do we actually need when we deploy a device? We need to be able to confirm it has a minimum set of uh, baseline requirements. We need to protect the data during the setup. So when you unbox a device, you cannot access data on, on the device in the same way if you redeploy a device. We need to deliver a compliant, secure device so the user can start working uh, in a secure environment. And we need to personalize the out-of-box ex uh, experience. And that is where the status page uh, come in. If we think of it as um, normal deployment with, uh, for example, SCCM, when we deploy the device directly in front of the user, there's a status page from the task sequence where it shows how long it's gone and when it will be finished. It's the same with the, the autopilot uh, 
status page. So the first page that's actually uh, a pain that's uh, being shown is the device preparation. The first thing it looks for is uh, the TPM uh, validation step. Is it actually valid? Is it uh, in there? It will uh, continue in the background of uh, Azure AD joining and MDM enrolling uh, the device. And it, when it's finished with uh, that, and there's also some small policies you can put down to the to the device in that in that state. I will come back to that uh, later. Then we have the device setup where we can see the status of policies and profiles de delivered directly to the device, certificates, uh, application, and at last we can see what is delivered to the user, both from uh, policy state and application state and certificate and so on. And if some things fail, then you can see I have a certificate failing, uh, failing in here. So then you as an IT department need to uh, decide is the user allowed to log into this device? If the user is al allowed to log in, then you can set up the yellow text with uh, a custom information for the, for the end user. You can allow the user to, uh, to try again, see if they can get the policies down. You can uh, reset the, allow the user to reset the device, or you can continue anyway. That is some settings that you set up as an IT administrator and not something that the user has to decide about. So, how is it actually working? So, the first thing I told you was about grouping of, uh, of autopilot devices. This is, a, this is an autopilot device that is a file directly uh, ready for importing a one autopilot device. I have, some, uh, I have a device number. A device serial number, I have a Windows product ID, a hardware has, that is uh, all the stuff down here. Then I have an order ID. The order ID I can uh, decide for myself. In this case, I have called it the uh, SIAT device. And when I have the order ID, then I can create a group based on it. And when I have a dynamic group, then I can deliver uh, different policies and different uh, application during the startup of the autopilot service. So as we are going into Azure AD, this is the new uh, device management uh, portal for Microsoft. That is why there's an orange ribbon in, in, in the top. So when I go into uh, Azure AD and groups, and I search for all my autopilot groups. As you can see, I have two in my demo environment. The one is the all uh, autopilot devices, and the other is, uh, is a shared device. So when I have the uh, all autopilot device, then I have a dynamic membership. The dynamic membership is, um, is based on a ZTD ID that's created on the object when you create an Azure AD object with the autopilot service. And because I want a dynamic group that catches all my autopilot devices except for my shared devices, then I have created a not uh, equation to saying that the order ID must not be uh, shared devices. So now I have two groups. I have the cats all group for autopilot. And then I have the, uh, the shared devices where I'm only uh, looking at uh, the order ID shared devices. So as we, if we're going into the profile, the autopilot profile in Windows enrollment and autopilot profile, I will create a, a new one for take days uh, Sweden. As you can see, there's also a, a point over here where you can allow non-autopilot devices to get um, to get inventoried. That is only working with Windows 10 1809. It will go out within the next 48 hours if I set it to yes. 
to query the, the device, get the hardware ID and whatever it else need for the autopilot to work, and get it back inside the inside Intune. I will not do that in, in this uh, demo. And then deployment mode, we have two things. We have the self-deployment in, uh, in preview, and we have the user-driven. The self-deployment requires uh, Ethernet connection and a physical TPM chip. So we take the user-driven, and we select the, uh, the Azure AD join and the out-of-box experience. So when we look at the out-of-box experience, we need to hide the end-user license agreement so the end-user do not have to, to select that and the privacy settings. And we have an option again for Windows 10 1809 to hide change account options. So when you're setting up a new device in the bottom left corner, you can actually skip out and create a local user that we can hide now, but it's only for Windows 10 1809. Uh, and then, as far as I know, this is the only way when we Azure AD join a device, we can do it with a standard user. If we're taking a device, unbox it from new, and Azure AD join it into a Azure AD tenant, the first user will be local admin on the, on the device. We also have the possibility to do naming. So instead of desktop and some random number, now we can uh, now we can do a prefix. So in my case, I will do OSD and ran, and I would have five numbers. And again, this is only a Windows 10 1809 feature. Um, so if you are not putting down your image yourself, then you are leveraging on the OEM vendors to deliver devices with 1809 to use some of the new features. So now I have a profile, and then I can deploy it to, uh, to the group of, uh, of devices. If you're looking at the enrollment status page, that is also uh, relatively new that we can uh, do more than one. So I will create a settings. The first one is actually saying, yes, I want to enable the, uh, the status page. So I click yes on that one. Then the second question I need to answer is, do I, do I want to block the end user from getting access to the device before it's, uh, it's finished? So again, it's, it is yes, we want to do it in a more secure way and then we do it than we did it earlier. So allow the end user to reset the device if an installation occurred. That is actually OK. If something went wrong, then they can reset the device. Allow the end user to use the device in case of any uh, errors uh, during the setup. That is something you need to think about concerning your corporate uh, policies. So in this case, I, was, I would say no. And then we have a, a timing uh, to say when are the, it's actually need to be, be, be done. And then we can take uh, and create our own text to the end user. The picture you saw earlier with the yellow text. Now we can create uh, a, a custom text. And then we can allow the end user to uh, create a, a lock and send it to the IT department. I do not love to give the end user the possibility to collect locks on the device. They need to put in a USB, click on that, go into uh, Windows Explorer, point to the USB, and save the lock files, and then hand it over to the IT department. So in this case, I would say no. And create. And then I can assign it. As you can see here, now I actually have a priority. Priority. We have the default that applies to everybody unless they have another group membership. So now we can use this to uh, apply to everybody. But if we have users, we know that they use shared devices, 
and wants to log in, they don't need to see the status page every time they log into a new device. So then we can just disable the auto the uh, autopilot uh, status page. So that was what I'm going to tell about autopilot at the moment. I will come back to some of it uh, later to see where it actually makes sense in from the user perspective as well. So how to uh, implement a MDM security uh, baseline? That is a question I get a lot from, uh, from customers. We have a lot of customers saying, we don't want to go modern, we don't want to get in the cloud because we cannot use all our GPOs we have today, we cannot use our security baseline to secure the, the device. So what can we do today? How many of you are using uh, Microsoft security uh, baseline in your group policy today? There's some. Microsoft releases uh, security baseline every time they come a new uh, Windows version. I have the 1803 here. Uh, and the reason why I have the 1803 is uh, National Cyber Security Center in the UK have created an MDM security baseline that we can leverage on. If we are looking at, uh, at this one and downloading it, there's no MDM settings in it. You need to go back to the Windows 10 709. And it's the same for the draft that just got out for the 1809. So what can we actually, uh, actually do? We can create our own manually. We can set all the settings that we want to set. We can set all the settings that our security department say we need to have on a PC to, to, to get access. We can import one with a graph API. Uh, I use the one from the National Security uh, Cyber Center in, in, in the UK. I've actually created my own script uh, to import it because the one uh, from the UK has uh, nine imports and uh, one of them is the, is the firewall. The, the, at the time they created it, they created it as a custom policy because there was no firewall policy directly in, in Intune. And there is now, so I've uh, created a, a script that creates the, the firewall policy uh, correct. And then we have compliance policy. Compliance policy we can use either for reporting to see is the device compliant. It's not a compliance state like we have in Config Manager where we can define our own compliance with, uh, with scripts and so on. But we can report on it and we can use it with conditional access. So together with conditional access, we can see if a device is compliant and on the compliance state, it's a true or false, yes or no. So if our device is compliant, then we have access to data. That could be Office 365, SAP in the, in the cloud, leverage from, uh, from Azure AD. That could be uh, VPN. So if our device is not compliant, then we will not get access to VPN in our on-premise uh, environment. So we have a different kind of way of doing this uh, now that we did not have earlier and we did not have with, uh, with Windows 7. So the compliance policy we can also uh, check for, for, for BitLogger. And when we talk about uh, BitLogger and Azure AD joint devices, it is important that we have uh, self-service. I actually got the screen uh, earlier today at the hotel. Uh, I was quite uh, anxious about if I actually had the BitLogger key stored in Azure AD or I needed to use another, another device. But with the self-service, and we can do that in cloud-only devices or hybrid devices, or hybrid Azure AD joint devices, store the BitLogger key directly in Azure AD on the device object, and the end user can use self-service from 
company portal, from a web portal, from my apps, um, so they can do it without calling the IT department if they're getting this, uh, this message. So let's have a closer look on how we implement the security baseline. I have the PowerShell script that's uh, rewritten. The most of it is actually written by a guy from Microsoft co called uh, Davis Falkers. It is, uh, it is on, uh, on GitHub, and that's all the, the first stuff. And then when you come down to it, it is all JSON files. And this one is uh, app logger policy. It creates the app logger policy in uh, MDM that we can push out to the uh, to the device. Like I said earlier, you can do it manually or you can do it by script, but if you look at this one and you need to put it in manually, you will fail because there's so many ways uh, that this one can get uh, within another character set. Uh, then you have um, Gnifus stays uh, in another way, and then it will not work, and you will get an error on the device. So do it with uh, scripting. When you have the, uh, the script created, you can just export it and use it in another tenant. If you have a test tenant, you can create it there, export it, and import it directly into a production tenant. So when I run this one, I will be asked for the name of my uh, admin who have rights to create these, uh, these policies. And it will look for Azure AD. And as you can see, it will create the policies. So when I go into uh, my Intune tenant, I have my device configuration and my profiles. And I have all of these. And you can see the timing of when you, the policies was actually created. It is going quite fast. You cannot do it by hand or manually uh, in that way. And you can see we have the, uh, the app logger policy. Directly stored, uh, stored in here. And if we take a look at one of the other policies, that could be the be the firewall policy directly in the uh, in the endpoint protection. Then I have my endpoint protection, and I have my firewall settings. I used to have my firewall settings. Yeah, Windows Defender Firewall. So now I can actually push this down to the to the client, and it could be configured as secure as the MDM stack now nowadays support. This is the way we do it with uh, with the MDM. Some of the settings, like the uh, the app logger, that is ADMX backported. Uh, stuff that we can do on, on, on the client. And if you look in here and see, it's not that easy to, uh, to create. Later this year, Microsoft will create a security baseline based on their own um, recommendation. So you just have to enable it. Then all default settings that Microsoft recommend will be enabled, and then you can disable the one you don't, uh, don't want in your in your environment. So when we have created the, the policies, one of the policies is also uh, enforcing, um, enforcing BitLogger. When you have an Instant Go device and your Azure AD join it, it will automatically be, uh, be BitLogger en encrypted and the key will be stored in, uh, in, in Azure AD. If you have a non-instant-go device, you need to push down a 
policy who's saying that you need to in encrypt this one. And if you are a standard user, that is not, then you're not able to do it before Windows 10 1809, and then you have to create a policy set to, uh, to, to enable it. So if we look at uh, what we can do in a, in a compliant state, So I have a have a policy here. I will create a a policy. This is a compliance policy I can use for conditional access uh, later on. I can uh, create it by platform. As you can see, there's also Android, iOS, and and Mac. But you can also see there's no Windows 7 here, so it's only working on uh, on Windows 10. So When I take uh, my Windows 10 here, I have some uh, different settings I can I, I can test upon. One of them is is BitLocker enabled, is Secure Boot enabled, and yes, of course, we want to check if the device is uh, encrypted with BitLocker, and we need to have uh, Secure Boot enabled. Then, in my company and in most of the companies uh, doing MDM code integrity is not an option. Code integrity requires that we set up um, device guard on, on, on application that is uh, the level over, uh, over app logger. And to get that working in an environment takes a lot of time. You need to create a signature file for everything you are using on, on the device. And nothing that's in that's not in your uh, signature file cannot be started on the on the device. But it's it is a secure way to do it. Then we have the device properties. The device properties we can set in a minimum version of uh, of OS to look at that could be OS version not supported by Microsoft anymore. Uh, there. The places we have done conditional access, and we have set a manual entered uh, version number, if it is on iOS, or on Android, or on Windows, when we come back a year later, nobody has touched that number. So it's, in my opinion, a false security measure to, to do it, because you need to do it uh, manually. So we will not set that setting, but we will look at what uh, system security we have uh, in place. We can look at the, the firewall. Is the, the firewall actually uh, enabled up and running? And you can see here there's also uh, antivirus and anti-spyware. That is third-party antivirus snapping into the Windows Defender Security Center. When the, the Windows Defender Security Center detects that there is an antivirus uh, enabled, then we can uh, use it with, uh, with conditional access. But if we're using Windows Defender, we can just say it needs to be there. We can say that the uh, anti-malware signature needs to be up, to up to date, and real-time protection needs to be, be enabled. So now when we look at a device for compliance, it is bitlockered, it is encrypted, It is uh, running with secure boot. It has firewall enabled. It has Defender uh, anti-malware uh, running and up to date. So, in many situations, I will actually trust this device. If that is not enough, then we have another option with Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection. I know that is a higher level of uh, of licensing but I know more and more uh, customers are getting it. So if you have it, just start looking at, at it. Then we can leverage uh, the signals from Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection to see is the device actually in a, in a risk score where we are not allowing it to get access to our, to our data. When you're starting to do this, if you have been running Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection for a while, 
Then you have a lot of uh, devices that's not remediated because they're running a, a older version of uh, of Windows 10 and there's no auto remediation in. So the first time we enabled this in a in a, a POC, we actually blocked uh, access for customer data for for some for some customers. So it's important to know what is the current status of your devices in uh, Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection if you're using this one. So, so what can we actually use uh, our conditional access for? We can, like I said earlier, we can use it to ensure that we only have access to data where we trust the uh, where we trust the devices. When we trust the devices, it needs to be uh, Intune managed. If it, that is uh, Intune standalone, or if it's co-management with both, both SCCM and Intune on the same device, that is also uh, a way. That is a way to take what we have on-premise and use the best of the cloud, in, at least in my, uh, my opinion. So, how would it actually look if I'm trying to get access to uh, to OneDrive if I do not have uh, a compliant device? So I'm logging into uh, OneDrive on this uh, device. I'm using my uh, login credentials. And my password, if I can remember the password. And then I would get an MFA because I've set up a conditional access policy that every time I'm not on in my home uh, network, I will uh, get an MFA when I'm trying to get access to, uh, to the data. Uh, stored in the cloud. Because I'm using Chrome, Chrome can, cannot detect if the device is compliant or not unless it's running Windows 10, 703 and forward and having a um, and having a, a plugin to the browser, the Windows 10 account uh, plugin. So that's why I'm using it uh, today to show to show it on the same on the same device. So the message I'm getting back is that my organization is not allowing me to download, print, or sync any uh, data to the device. I need to be uh, domain joint, that is hybrid domain joint, or I need to be marked as compliant for uh, for Intune. As you can see, I can upload data to OneDrive, but I cannot download data to uh, to OneDrive. If I take this one, I will not get a download uh, link. But if I'm going over to uh, Edge Browser, Edge Browser natively look at the uh, at the compliance status on the on on the device. So when I'm logging in here with the same user, so it should be enforced by the same policy. And I'm not getting MFA validated for this one because I'm logged in with Windows Hello. Windows Hello is MFA validation enough. So if we look at the logging in Azure AD, we can actually see that I've already been challenged with an MFA. And now you can see I can download all uh, all the data. So this is a way of uh, ensuring that we only have access to corporate data on devices that we actually trust. So that was about the MDM baseline and using the conditional access to see if our device is, uh, is compliant. Then we have to the get the best user experience. 
get the best user experience means different things for different companies and different sectors. But this is my take on uh, getting a good user experience or maybe the best user experience or at least a better user experience in, in default. So what can we do to help the user to get the user uh, up and running with autopilot and getting all of the, the data uh, right away when they're logging in. We can use Rondive for business, known folder move. Uh, I created a script earlier this year to uh, an engine script to set this up uh, as a policy and we deployed it uh, with some customers and it actually worked fine until we did an autopilot reset of the device. Then we have some issues sometimes, not all of the times. It could take up to seven days be before the policy is getting down when we run it by, by script. So we can do it with the ADMX-based um, policies. I will show you in a bit. Then we have uh, enterprise state roaming. Enterprise state roaming takes uh, your background picture, your lock screen, uh, settings apps, uh, uh, settings in apps, in modern apps, uh, including the Edge browser with the favorites. So when we create a policy with Intune the saying we, we allow Internet Explorer and Edge browser's favorites to be synced, then we can also back up uh, Internet Explorer uh, uh, favorites. So when we log into a new device or we get it redeployed, we have all our favorites uh, down again. It does not take care of uh, Chrome browser links and uh, Firefox or other uh, browsers. And then we can disable consumer experience. That went out uh, last year, I believe, where we can create a policy to disable consumer experience. Do everybody know what com consumer experience is? The Candy Cross experience, where you get the Candy Cross on your device. When we do autopilot, most of the devices is uh, born with uh, Windows 10 Pro. Windows 10 Pro cannot disable uh, consumer experience. So when we do the autopilot, we also need to uh, do a transformation into an enterprise uh, SKU of uh, Windows. But we can actually take this cons consumer uh, experience policy and put it down before on the device before it starts up and the user have access to the, um, to the desktop and all the application starts to be installed, including, uh, including uh, Candy Crush. And then we can uh, do uh, custom start menu. Custom start menu is something I have discussed both with uh, uh, customers and with colleagues since uh, we started deploying Windows 10 three years ago. Um, if you do a policy of and create the start menu uh, as a policy, then the end user cannot change it. So that's not a good user experience. But you can still use it to help the, the end user by creating a lockdown box. Uh, I will show how it uh, looks like with your corporate uh, line of business application, uh, with the, all the office apps. So when you're actually uh, calling service, they can say, I cannot find, uh, find uh, the Outlook or my SAP link, then you know it will always be where you put it. You can move the box around in the start menu, but you cannot delete it and you cannot add links to it and you cannot remove links to it. And then there's the two-step verification. Whenever uh, Azure AD joint device is getting uh, into uh, well, whenever a device is getting into Azure AD, a two-step verification kicks in because it's enabling uh, Windows Hello for Business by uh, by default. The first time we did a Windows 10 deployment was uh, almost to the day three years ago in a public school in Denmark, and first and second grade was getting a new device, but we needed their parents to get in, to have a phone with them, to deal with the two-step verification. Um, in January 2016, 
Microsoft created a policy inside Intune where we can disable the uh, Windows Hello for business, but that is, an, that is a tenant-wide setting. So when we disable it, it applies to every user in the, in the tenant. Over the summer, we got a new uh, policy identity protection inside Intune, so now we can actually turn it back on for a pilot group of users, because we almost in any ca like every case where we do uh, modern management, we want to use uh, Windows Hello for Business. It is nice, it is easy, and the end users getting rid of entering their password on the on the device, and when they use Windows Hello for Business, they don't need to get prompted for MFA to Office 365 that often. So, let's take a closer look of uh, the best user experience. We talked about the OneDrive, a known folder move. We have OneDrive here, and Autosave, and update our folders. With the policy I created, I move uh, desktop pictures and documents, and I'm actually setting a policy that do not allow the end user to move the folders, the known folders, back. So I always know where the end user is storing the data. And how do we, uh, do, we do that? Like I said earlier, I created a policy with a set of uh, registry keys. And that is, uh, that is actually working quite good. You can all, if you have a hybrid joint devices, you can also do it with a, with a DPO. So it is not always the best way to do it. So if we do it with uh, ADMX, I have a script that imports uh, a con policy configuration uh, with uh, with JSON, and I have the uh, the JSON fi file it itself. So if I'm just looking at the at the JSON file. You can see that it is uh, creating uh, some stuff. This one is actually the whole ADMX file uh, from the OneDrive, putting in uh, to Intune that's pushing it out to, to the device. Then we have the silent uh, account configuration. <coughs> and we have the silent redirection of, uh, of OneDrive and the policy that said we are not allowed to move the data, the data back, and we enable the, the files on demand. On the known folder move, move policy, we also need to create the input the tenant ID. So in the script, I do not have the the tenant ID. So if you're downloading this from from GitHub and using it, uh, remember to uh, replace the the tenant ID. So I will import it and I will take my JSON file and put it in here. And if we look at our policy in, uh, in Intune, I have a ADMX based where I can actually do and set the same settings as I did in a PowerShell script uh, before. This one is getting down on the, on the device and is actually applying to the um, autopilot uh, status, uh, status page, so it will not get moving on before these uh, settings are, are set on the device. As you can see here in the policy ADMX, this is just the ADMX files. Uh, from from the policy set that downloaded with the uh, with the new uh, OneDrive client. So when we push this out, I will get automatically configured the the OneDrive settings. 
and we also have the uh, the enterprise uh, state roaming. It's actually done just one uh, flip of a switch. So if I'm going into devices in Azure AD and enterprise state roaming, and this is also working with the uh, hybrid Azure AD joint joint dev joint devices. I can do it for all my users, or if I'm doing a POC or just want to test it out, I can do it on a selected group and see how it's actually working for me. And then it will be stored in a secure blob storage in the Azure AD on the user object itself. So. The last point is uh, is application deployment. Application deployment has been an issue since we started uh, deploying Windows uh, in the cloud with uh, with Intune. As I said earlier, we could only uh, deploy MSI files and uh, and Windows Store files. Then last year we got the the PowerShell script. The PowerShell script uh, is actually working uh, quite nice. We could do a lot. We could uh, put down applications on the device. We can install it. But there were some issues about getting status back. Uh, um, so Microsoft took the whole uh, SCCM uh, application model, uh, except some few uh, exceptions, and uh, put it directly into, into Intune. So the things we could do before was uh, limited to uh, single MSI files. And almost every customer I, I have have MSI files with multiple files. And we have challenging with deploying complex uh, uh, Windows applications. So that was what we have, what we had. And now, I believe it's within the last two weeks, is enabled in preview in uh, in all Intune tenants. We have the possibility to deploy MSI, uh, EXE, MSPs, uh, MST file on uh, on MSI. We can do scripting uh, and and so on. So now we actually have a possibility to do application management on the on the device. So what do we need? to uh, create an application uh, to deploy with, uh, with Intune. We need to download a tool from, uh, from GitHub where we repackage it uh, in some kind of a zip file. We generate an app manifest where it contains uh, how do we install this application, how do we uninstall it, what's it our, what is our detection methods, and, and, and so on. And then we encrypt the installation file and package the content in an intune.wim uh, file. So how does it look when we do it? So I have just cheated a little bit. So we have then the Intune Win app utility we downloaded from Git, GitHub. Then we need to run it uh, with some parameters. Parameter C to point out what is the directory of, uh, of the files we need. So we have to put the files in the directory first. And then we have the, uh, the dash S where we take on our uh, installation uh, file, if it's a .exe or scripting file or MSI or, or whatever we need. And then we need to have an output file where do we put this new application we package uh, in, into a file before we upload it to Intune. So I will create the file. This is a f installation file with uh, around six megs, so it's not uh, that much. So if we go in into Intune, into client application, and take an app and add it. For those of you who have actually worked with uh, Intune before, you can see that uh, there's a new Win32 uh, app uh, type available. It's, that is in, in preview. <coughs> 
So I will select that. I will select the package type. <coughs> so I will point out the file I just uh, created, the engine win. Say OK. I will have some app information, so I will call the app what is name. It's a clipping tool. And it's like snag it. And I can also select a, a logo, like an icon as a, an icon file. So I have the icon file here. I have the program. I use the uh, the installer. Just take the installer from here. And then I'll take the uninstall spring. So I can actually push out the, the uninstall of the application. So now I have the uh, the install string of the application. I have packets down into the intune.wim file. Then I have the requirement. The requirement I need to select, uh, can this run on a 32-bit or 64-bit uh, uh, OS? So I select both. And what is the minimum requirement of the operating system? And I just say uh, an old uh, version, so I'm sure it's working. Then I can set up some other uh, requirements uh, if I need it. I don't do that in, in this, uh, this demo. Then I have some a detection rule that detects if the when the application is actually uh, installed. So I will take the manually. I will add, and in this case I will do uh, MSI. And I have the product code here. So now I have the MSI product code, and I have the possibility to change the return codes if the application is not uh, performing as as I want. If it's actually a success, if it com comes with a different uh, return code. So now I have created it. It will start uploading to, uh, to Azure. You can see it's not ready yet, but it's uploading. Uh, I've created another application so you can see how it looks like. So I have a Adobe Reader here. And I can actually install it on uh, on on the device, and that is the MSI installer with an MST and an, P and an um, MSP file. So it's actually up to date and configured, so we can deploy it to the to the end user. So, how do we start a POC on a cloud management uh, or pure cloud uh, Windows 10 deployment? We need to have a cloud identity. If we want to use SCCM and co-management, uh, we still need to have the cloud identity. So it's actually a good way of doing it. A lot of customers already running Office 365, so they have a cloud identity or a hybrid uh, identity. It is only Windows 10. We cannot support Windows 7 uh, on this one. Intune standalone is a great idea. Uh, Intune hybrid with SCCM is, um, has been deprecated and will go out of uh, support next year in, uh, in September. And then we need to describe some minimum security and management requirement for our device. We cannot do a POC if we do not have these requirements before we start up. And we need, if we have a security department, to get them to sign off on it as well. And then we need to find some test users. Test users is normally the guys who's never getting into the office, sales guys and, and so on, developers. Uh, we have done it with all kind of, uh, all kind of uh, users. So that was Actually, what I had, I would tell you today, uh, when we do cloud uh, deployment or Windows deployment in a whole, we need to look at the whole perspective. We need to 
do the great user experience, the easy deployment, uh, the secure way, either with MDM or, or, or GPOs, but start looking at conditional access if you have not done it already. So, thank you for today, and uh, please remember to fill out the evaluation. And my time is up. This is Tech Days. <laughs>